This is Roger Marsh for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Now, before we begin this broadcast, I need to remind you that some of the content that we'll be discussing today is intended for mature audiences. So if you have little ones listening in right now, parental discretion is definitely advised. Either occupy them with something else, or you can come back to this presentation at a later time, listening on our website at drjamesdobson.org. Thanks so much for joining us for this edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Today on Family Talk. Well, greetings, everyone. I'm Dr. James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, which is a listener-supported ministry. We would not be here without those of you who are kind enough to help support us, and thank you. Uh, Today, we're going to discuss a very sobering subject, and I hope you listen carefully because it might have great meaning for you and your Christian friends. It brings to mind Charleston, South Carolina, Sutherland Springs, Texas, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Poway, California. I wonder if you know what those cities have in common. They are the sites of some of the most vicious terrorist attacks against places of worship in the last decade. They each involve the wanton, senseless murders of innocent worshipers. All of these events arose from a common hatred and hostility toward churches and Christianity at large. Because of these violent acts, we're required to take safety measures to protect ourselves. I think everybody knows that. Unfortunately, this is the world in which we live. I'm joined today by Mr. Carl Chin. He's a national spokesman for church security and currently serves as the president of the Faith-Based Security Network, which we'll talk about later. I've known Carl for many, many years, going back to his years at Focus on the Family, where he was the building manager for the ministry. Carl has addressed numerous law enforcement, security professionals, and ministry leaders across the nation. He's also been tracking violent attacks against religious organizations since the late 1990s. His book, Evil Invades Sanctuary, documents some of the research he compiled, which we'll talk about today. Carl has a very up close and personal connection to this issue. He was at Focus on the Family in 1996 when an armed assailant came on our campus and held him and three others hostage. I was in Washington, D.C. that day. Carl, thank you for being here. And as a place to start, tell us your perspective on what happened that day. You know, Doctor, I was setting up my desk right up behind the HR training room, and my radio went off. And we had just enhanced our duress alarm system so that we would get messages over our radio. And uh, I know we talked about it back then, but one thing I never told you, but I'll tell you today, when I got that message, it said administration building front desk. And I took off for the front desk. But what I didn't tell you before was I thought it was somebody wondering what's this new button do. And since I worked with So you thought they were just playing with it? I thought it was somebody testing it. And Mm -hmm. so I, being a black and white person and working with blueprints and specifications, I thought, I'll just measure this and see how long it would take me to get there if it was the real deal. Mm -hmm. And, Doctor, I walked clear up on the gunman looking at my watch. I never looked up until I was right at him, and I remember thinking 17 seconds, not bad. I could be here pretty quick if this was the real Mm -hmm. deal, and I looked up, and I was face-to-face with a gun. He took you and three others hostage on that day. He had a gun. Mm -hmm. What was he demanding? At first, it was very unclear. He was just angry and cussing and telling everybody that he was going to blow the building up. He had a firearm in his right hand and his left hand. He had a trigger device connected to a pile of green army bags on the floor in which he claimed was enough explosives to bring the building down. And uh, he was just very unclear at first, just cussing and saying, better get your blankety-blank people out of the building before I bring it down. And then it was 
after everybody was out of the building except the four of us that it became clear that he was wanting to make a phone call. And he kept saying, uh, once I make this phone call, it'll all be over. And we didn't know what that would mean, but I didn't want to let that happen. Hmm. Actually, at one point, he fired his gun, and uh, there, when I left there, there was a bullet hole. It's still there. Uh, up uh, 10 feet from the yep. floor. Yep. How did that happen? That happened after he released us. We, the four of us, were released about 90 minutes into the into the hostage situation. And the Colorado Springs Police Department hostage negotiator that was on the phone to him said that he fired that one shot. And he asked him, he said, what was that? And the gunman said it just went off accidentally. I never believed that, and neither did the police, because suicide people will often pull the trigger once just to get the feel. Yeah. And, uh, well, I was, uh, as I said, I was in Washington, D.C., and I got a phone call saying that there's a hostage situation. The gunman is in our entry uh, area. The building was totally surrounded by police and snipers and uh, the SWAT team members, uh, and they were just in kind of a waiting mode trying to figure out what this guy was going to do. They didn't want to put our employees at risk, and I'm getting all this information uh, by phone. The one thing I could do about it was wait and hear. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, took place? How did that unfold? Well, one reason they were limited in what they could do is he kept holding up that trigger device like it was a dead man trigger and, and daring them to kill him. You had said, to take that serious. Said, you shoot me, I'll drop this, and these explosives will go off. And so that was one of the things that was creating an issue for him. And, uh, of course, he had the two ladies right there in the enclosure with him. I was outside, and so was the security guy. And uh, we were on the outside of that desk. I mean, still right there by him, but yeah. not inside the enclosure with him. Did and, you ever consider tackling him or trying to disarm him? You know, it's the kind of thing where the guy really has control at that point. He's got a gun in one hand. He's got what's supposedly a dead man trigger in the other. Your options are pretty limited. Um, on what you can do. And we had the same issue that the law enforcement did. Now, as I remember the incident occurring, the police came in the building and were behind a wall, and they were just getting ready to charge him, to run at him, and he gave up. That's right. They were right at the end when they were getting ready to take action. And when probably he finally kill him gave if up. they had And to. they probably would have. And I asked the police negotiator, I said, what made him give up? He said, I told him, if you'll lay down your weapons and disarm your, your explosives and put your hands above your head, I'll have your picture on every news media in southern Colorado. He said, we will have news media outside. They will film you coming out, and your story will be told. He said, if you force us to kill you, I'll do everything I can to keep this quiet. And he said, I was telling him the truth, and he knew it. He said, Well, what he was angry about is he had been a steel construction worker. That is and correct. And had, uh, during the building process, he had slid down a girder. That's right. And lost control and fell. Mm -hmm. And fell on some steel rods down below. That's and right. And penetrated his... Uh, midsection. Well, he was terribly he was, injured. It was a he? very bad injury. I was there the day he was injured. And uh, I went out and looked at the injury. You know, I, as building engineer, I was out at the building often, and I saw the ambulance come. I saw him take him. And that was in October of 1992, October 28th. So he had lived with this for four years. He had lived with this budding anger for four years, and then he decided to come back and exact his revenge. And his anger was misplaced because right. he was working for a contractor, he but was he was coming everybody. after us, yep. uh, hoping for a lot of money, I guess. I think that's the root of it. And, you know, that, that gets back to what I do now. You never know when somebody walks through your door what the source of their hatred or their anger is. And it may make no sense to a normal person processing 
good thoughts. But when yeah. somebody has anger and hatred and vindication, you don't know what's in their mind when they come through your door. Well, he was arrested that day and he was, was uh, charged and tried and found guilty and mm-hmm. sentenced to 17, 17 years. 17 years. Um, but let's talk about you. You were there that day, and that made a profound impact on you. And in fact, you began to do a study uh, on churches and other religious organizations that were subjected to this kind of assault. That's right. All the details are different, but you learned a lot from that. Sure did. Uh, Something else I never told you about that day, but remember I I became the spokesman for the ministry and the four hostages in the trial that followed. And every day before I went to the trial, we would gather in prayer up there in the boardroom most often. And uh, one of those days before I went to the courthouse, we were praying. And you know how it is when you're praying and, and you're also in a personal conversation with God. And the prayer's going on, but I felt like the Lord was telling me that I should uh, write about the things that I'd learned. And I remember just almost arguing with God. I was standing there. I'm the building engineer. (laughs) I don't Mm -hmm. write. I look at blueprints, and I work with contractors. I don't write. I failed writing in high school. (laughs) I got an (laughs) F, doctor. Uh, And, you know, I, I was standing there as people were praying and And we said the amens, and so I said amen and just kind of figured I'll have this conversation with God later. And Charlie Jarvis was standing right next to me, and he put his hand on my shoulder. He was one of my executive vice presidents. He was. (laughs) And he said, you need to write all this stuff down. You need to write a book. And I've, I've never told Charlie that what he told me was what I was hearing from the Lord. Well, you did write a book. It's called Evil Invades Sanctuary. So you're talking about the broad scope of the danger that is faced by every Christian organization or church or ministry, including our own. That's right. That's right. It all started there in the lobby of Focus on the Family because that day I really wasn't thinking it would ever happen here. Yeah, we'd done some improvements after Oklahoma City. That's why we installed some upgrades is Oklahoma City got our attention. But, you know, Doctor, I still didn't think it would happen here. And that denial is is what cripples a lot of leaders. That's one of the conclusions you've drawn. You bet. That um, Christian pastors and ministers and those in positions of authority do not understand that they are also at risk. That's right. That's right. They, They often have a tendency to... Uh, believe and even at times say, well, God will protect us. And, you know, a a scripture I go back to often is Matthew, the sixth chapter, where Jesus told us, don't worry about what you eat, drink, and wear. And I I believe worry is a mild case of atheism. I think that's really what he was saying. But, you know, I've never met anybody who sits up in the morning and clothes float down on them out of heaven. We have to be intentional about those things that we eat, drink, and wear. And safety and security is the same way. I believe God protects us. I do. I I told you we have 20 grandchildren. I pray over those vehicles when they go somewhere. If I can get a chance to go out in the morning if they're visiting us, I'll lay hands on that vehicle and beg God to protect them. But you know what? I I also want my sons and my sons-in-laws to buckle them up, and yeah. I want them to drive right, and I want them to watch for other drivers and be a good defensive driver. It takes both action and faith. So you went on from that beginning to what you're doing now. You're speaking in churches and organizations around the country, and you have become uh, quite an expert on this subject. One um, bit of information I got from your book is that from the early days of the United States of America, we went 187 years That's right. without an attack. It's not till 1963 that the first one occurred, and now it's all over the place. Now, when we say attack, it's careful to say, uh, let me be careful to emphasize in those 187 years, we'd never had a mass murder. 
A mass murder is defined by the FBI as four or more killed in a single related act. Had never occurred. Had never occurred. 187 years of American liberty had never occurred until September the 15th, 1963. Man, that tells you something about what's going on in America. It does. It does. It's a direct graph as to what's wrong because when Tree of Life happened in October of uh, 2018, where the the killer came in and killed 11 in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, that was the 15th mass murder since 1963. 187 years, no mass murders. Now here in 2019, we've had 15 since 19. Well, that's what we mean by senseless. When someone was murdered or and in some way assaulted in that way in those uh, earlier years of the country, it was usually anger between two individuals. That's right. Or two or more individuals. Now it's anger at the whole culture almost. That's it right. Is, it's That's an right. expression of hatred for humanity. Yeah. One thing that was consistent for years was people primarily, not always, but primarily killed people they knew. That has changed over the last 40 or 50 years, really. Uh, People will go in and commit a mass murder where they don't care what the names are. Let's go back to uh, the false sense of security that people have. Uh, If you go through one of those, you don't have that anymore. You think it can't happen to you. And as a matter of fact, right here in Colorado Springs, you experienced yet another one. (laughs) I did. It had to do with New Life Church here in Colorado Springs. Tell us what happened that day. We had law enforcement on site, and their agreement was over at 1 p.m. As soon as they left, within just a few minutes, We had smoke uh, from a commercial smoke canister where on the north main entry of our building and then on the south main entry and then the killer parked over by the east main entry and came in shooting. He killed two girls in the parking lot. We didn't know that, of course, on the inside of the building. I was upstairs with Brady and Jack Hayford and didn't even hear the shots outside. I didn't hear the shots until he was coming in the building. It was totally random. I totally remember he random. was just he didn't running through the parking lot, hear these poor girls That's right. stepped out in his pathway, and he killed That's them. That's right. That's right. They were just getting in their family van. David and Marie come out after Sunday church on cloud nine, going to dinner with their four daughters. They'd heard Jack Hayford. All of them loved it getting ready to go to dinner and then the shooting started and killed two of them and And, walked on in. And then went into the church? That's right. And those were the shots that I heard and several of the other. There were four of us still on duty and all four of us went towards the gunshots. Two of us were armed, two were not. The two who were unarmed turned around and started clearing kids out of the hallway and they did a remarkable thing that day, Buck and Dave did. They cleared that hallway of kids as bullets were going past them. And I set up in one ambush point down the hall, and I didn't even know Jean Assam was still there. She was brand new to our team, been there. This was her third week serving with us. Not a police officer. She She's was a, right in that area yep. where she was confronted. That's right. And what does she do? She blindsided the killer from his left side. She came down hallway 160 as he was shooting in my direction, and uh, he didn't even see her come in. And then she shouted her commands at him to drop his weapon. He didn't, and she fired and wounded him, and then he did what many of these cowards do. He stuck the gun in his own mouth and pulled the trigger. Isn't it amazing that right in the same area... Three and a half miles away. You were involved in an incident like that. Yeah. And, and, Doctor, after that second one, I was absolutely convinced that my life has changed. It has gotten definition. And i got to do something to get this message out that we need. So you feel the Lord has laid this on you and said, this is, this is your mission? No question. I am very focused on this. And I I do feel like this is the one thing that God called me to do. Carl, we mentioned that you're very knowledgeable of this issue of the risk that churches and Christian organizations are facing 
and now you are being asked to come and speak and um, advise people on how they can get uh, more protection for mm -hmm. their organizations and for their churches and individuals. When you come, what do you say? How do you begin to inform them of what they need to know? Well, one thing is I, I often surprise churches and communities because I, I tell them how we started our program at New Life and what we called our safety team and what it's still named to this day. The, you tell them why? I do. I tell them we're the life safety ministry because the last thing we want to do is have volunteers serving on our team based on the sensationalism associated with security. We want people who are truly an ambassador of Christ. They truly care for other people. Don't you first have to convince them that they need to take steps to protect themselves because they many people live in bedroom communities and they don't really believe it can happen here. Yes. Tell us that it can. Oh my goodness, it can't it ever. And I was one of those people who didn't believe it'll happen here. As we said yesterday, uh, when I first walked up to that gunman at Focus on the Family, I didn't think anything was real. And the thing that that did is it changed me, and I decided I don't want anybody else to have that stupid feeling because mm -hmm. it, it, it just catches you flat-footed and surprised when you're not expecting something like that. We have a sick culture. We do. We have mental illness everywhere. We have drugs. We have people who are confused. They're angry. They have been abused themselves, some of them have children. They often do crazy things. I mean, who would shoot two little girls down in cold blood like occurred at New Life Church? Who would do that? And, and you look at that and you look at something like Sutherland Springs. I was here across the glass when you interviewed Frank and Sherry Pomeroy, very, very dear friends of mine. That and was that, in Texas. Then Texas. And that killer just walked around the outside of the church just shooting holes through the wall, not caring who he was killing. Did that for several magazines worth out of his AR and then came through the doors and shot so much inside the building that the smoke was thick. Sutherland Springs, Texas. I used to live down there. Who would have believed that that would happen in that peaceful community? Yeah. Even Frank himself will tell you, and he often tells audiences that on Saturday before the killing happened there, he was asked by a guy, what do you think about all these church shootings? And Frank said, it'll never happen at Sutherland Springs. And the guy said, why? And he said, well, two reasons. One, nobody knows where Sutherland Springs is. And he said, another reason is we all carry guns in Texas. We're Texans or something to that effect. And Frank tells audiences now, he says, you know, having concealed carry and having a couple guys that you know carry, that's no plan. That's no plan. <laughs> that's just having guys who might carry a gun. You've got to be intentional about it. We are out of time for today, uh, but we're obviously not through. We haven't even gotten into what churches can do, and that's where we'll start next time. Okay. For those that will not hear us next time, how can they get in touch with you? www.fbsnamerica.com Carl, thanks for Thank being you, with Dr. us. It's this is a very important topic. Thank you. God be with you. Thank you. I'm Roger Marsh, and you've been listening to Dr. Dobson's conversation with church security expert Carl Chin. Now, I know today's program was heavy to listen to at times, but this is certainly an important topic nonetheless. Churches and faith-based organizations must be ready to defend themselves from real physical danger. And as Carl said today, we can always rely on God's protection. However, he does call us to be smart and also to be prepared. Learn more about Carl's organization called Faith-Based Security Network when you visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. Once you're there, you'll also see a link for the book that we discussed today. It's called Evil Invade Sanctuary. 
Find all of this information and more when you go to drjamesdobson.org and then click on to the broadcast page. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for the conclusion of this enlightening conversation on church security. That's coming up next time right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tim Clinton, Executive Director of the James Dobson Family Institute. Our ministry here exists to honor the Lord through ministering to today's families and marriages all over the world. We couldn't accomplish that, however, without your support. And as the JDFI, the James Dobson Family Institute, continues to grow, we need your help. Visit us, will you do that, at drjamesdobson.org or call us toll-free at 877-732-6825. Stand with us and fight for righteousness and culture.